this uh, high podium. It looks more natural on Ryan than me. Um, hi. It's, uh, it's uh, incredible to be here, really. It's, uh, I can't believe I was asked, and uh, I'm, a <clears throat> I'm a big Clinton fan, uh, and, uh, and always have been. And uh, I saw the library today, and I wish I could uh, Bob G over there gave me a, a tour, and I wish I could have spent a day there. Um, it's so uh, astounding. It's an incredible place, and uh, so well designed, and it's got all that. They have every day of his schedule. You guys seen this? The whole yeah, everyone's like, oh, yeah. but I, I mean, I would, I just want to see every, every one of those. I would read. I'm a sucker for that kind of thing. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, it's. Uh, it's really an honor to be here, and I, I'm going to uh, babble about a couple things. I've got a slideshow, um, and I, I wanted to say thank you to Ryan, too. I uh, See, this is how I do my speaking. I ramble and babble. How's that? Does that work out for you? All right, good. Um, <clears throat> but Ryan is, uh, a, 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 as is clear, he came just to do a, a short stint, uh, and uh, we grabbed him and held tenaciously to him, and now we're ne never going to let him go. So... Um, He's been uh, a fantastic addition to our very small organization. Um, I haven't, I wrote this book, this is my first book I wrote uh, about 10 years ago, and I haven't read from it in about seven years. But there's a passage in it um, about Mr. Clinton, and uh, I thought I would read it if that's okay. Does that sound good to you? All right, good. Uh, so uh, this takes place in Berkeley in like 1993. Uh, I grew up in Chicago and uh, went to school in downstate Illinois. And uh, after school, uh, when I was a senior in college, my parents got sick and uh, they passed away when I was uh, 21. And then I had an eight-year-old brother. I, took, I would, became his guardian and we moved out to California. Uh, so this takes place a few years after we've been together living in Berkeley. Is that a good explanation? All right, good, thanks. I'm bad at setting things up, so I just want to make sure. Any questions so far? <laughs> All right. Because when, when uh, Skip said I was going to give a lecture, I said, no, no, no lecture. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> OK. At home, it's returning library books late and getting poster board for TOF's Map of Africa and grocery shopping at the place where they know us and know that we don't need a cart to carry the bags to the car, not us, because two men can carry six bags, four for me and two for TOF. We love carrying this stuff side by side and thus insist upon it. My brother is uh, about nine at this point. And one night after the grocery store and immediately after a bookstore visit from the north of Shattuck Avenue, right in the left middle of Berkeley's downtown, there comes a moving, gurgling volcano of lights. White lights popping from motorcycles, police cars yelling in red and blue, and then a slow river of shiny black, a procession. Too late for a funeral, it's already dark, but then what? They drive past, and about when we think they'll be out of sight, they stop. A man walks toward us from the direction of the caravan. It's Clinton, he says. He's eating at Chez Panisse. <laughs> we run. Tof and I are among the first there. I'm wild with excitement. I explain to Tof how thrilling this is, that inside this building is the president, and not just any president, but this is a president that well, we have some kind of crush on this man. <laughs> he speaks like a president. He can form sentences, complex sentences with beginnings and ends, subordinate clauses. You can hear his semicolons. <laughs> he knows the answers to questions. He knows acronyms and the names of foreign leaders, their deputies. It is heartening. It makes our country look smart. And this is an important thing, something we have been too long without. Oh, many were the times when Toph and I lay on my bed, my legs on his back, watching Clinton talk, points A and B and C. Jesus, how does he do it? Toph, I say, Toph, this man is actually bright, could be brilliant. This man still reads books. He's encyclopedic and charming and so real, and he, now here he is, mere feet away, eating the fresh and adventurous food stylings of California cuisine. Anyone been to Chez Panisse? You know this place? Alice Waters? All... I, don't, I, don't know. I don't know anything about food, but for people who enjoy food, it's, a, it's an important place, right? All right, good. 
We decide that we're staying until he comes out. Toph runs to the convenience store to get provisions, Fig Newtons and root beer and caramel. No comic books, I say. Okay, he says. Really, I'm timing you. This is the president, little man. Okay, okay, he says. While he's gone, more people arrive. There is a commotion, a civic bustle, just as Frank Capra would have imagined it. Charlie, what's all the hullabaloo about? Word is the president's inside. The president? Well, I'll be. <clears throat> when Toph gets back, there are about 20 people gathered on either side of the restaurant's door. Across the street, the cars and vans of the slow caravan stand still, doors open. Agents walk and squint and whisper, doing their agent things, wishing their friends could see them now. It's been about 20 minutes, and there are about 50 people around the door, some across the street, camped near the limos. We're standing at the very front, to the right of the door, no more than 20 feet away. We eat the snacks, and Toph drinks his root beer, which he set on the ground, holding it steady with his feet. He is so careful about the things he loves. Another half hour passes, and a hundred more gather. There are people ten deep behind us, a throng across Shattuck Avenue. We cannot fathom why people would stand across the street, easily a hundred feet away when they could be so close near us. Suckers, I tell Toph, thumbing toward those watching from so far away. It is important, I feel, that the boy knows what suckers look like. <laughs> to pass the time, we bounce on our toes, we trip each other, we play the game where you're not supposed to look at the circle made with a thumb and forefinger, and when you do, you are punched on the arm. We stop when given a sidelong look from one of the Secret Service men. Do we look menacing or just pathetic? Any minute now. Something occurs to me, though. How much time will Clinton have to mingle? Surely not much at all. So then, how will he decide where in the crowd to plunge? No way will he have time to shake the hands of us all, or even a portion of us, however doting. He will have to choose an area, a slice of us, most deserving and representative. I try to get Toph to take his baseball hat off. He is always wearing the cow hat with the smell of urine. He wears it to school between classes every moment until bedtime. He's trying to resist the onset of the curly hair. Already his hair is thickening, and the hat straightens it out, but now the hat is ruining our chances. <laughs> the hat makes us look disrespectful. We're a young hoodlum and his drug dealer. Off with the hat, I say. No, he says. Off with the hat. No. Good God, the door opens. A few randoms pour out, and then this huge gray-haired man. Man, he's a big guy. His face is so pink. <laughs> what happened to his face that it's so pink? Am I allowed to say that? Is that disrespectful? All right. I asked Toph why his face pink is so pink. Toph thinks for a second, but does not know. Flashbulbs, of course, and the screaming of things, mostly things like, we love you, Bill, because everyone does love him, because he's in the Bay Area. He is our man. He says things we believe and is so thrillingly articulate, and he knows we love him and has come here to bask in Berkeley even, at Chez Panisse, our town, our restaurant, and here he is to be adored and received and thanked and urged on. Because we are in Berkeley and the president is here, Toph and I are at the white-hot center of the entire world and history to date. But Toph can't see because some, suddenly some ugly rat bastard has shoved, shoved himself in front of us. It's unbelievable. I want to push this guy over, want to throw him to one side. How could we wait for so long and be so devoted and ready only to have this round-backed blank devour our chance for an audience with Bill. This will not stand. I'll toss him aside if need be. But will the president come our way? Will he know that we have been chosen? Surely he will know. If anyone will know, he will. After waving to the throng for a moment, Bill heads toward us. Of course, of course, here he comes, here he comes. Good Lord, his face is huge. Why so pink? Why so weirdly pink? Toph is being crushed, his face pressed against the back of this round-backed bastard man, and so I grab Toph, and I lift him, and his hat falls off, and Clinton is making his way from our left where our side began to us in the middle. Hands reach toward him, grasping for his flesh, and he reaches into the anemone of fingers, and as he reaches toward us, I lunge and take Toph's hand and thrust it toward the president's because close will not do here. 
chance is not good enough. And just as I throw Tove's little soft hand forward, Bill's big fat pink hand is there. Perfect timing and the president grabs and squeezes the little hand of my brother and I feel the jolt through me because we have completed the moment, have destroyed and begun a new world at this moment when we did all that was necessary. Tof touched his hand. Oh, if only there were a picture. Then, decades from now, when Tof was running for president himself, <laughs> there would be the shot of <clears throat> he and Clinton touching like God's finger lazily extended toward Adams, <laughs> like the photograph of Clinton shaking the hand of Kennedy. And who will Tof thank during his own inauguration? <laughs> oh yes, we know who he will thank. He will thank me. <laughs> he will be there in his blue suit, so tall and filled out and finally not wearing his urine-smelling hat. And he will say, I'll never forget when my brother, who tried so hard and suffered so long, lifted me over the heads of the throng to meet my destiny. Destiny spoken in a whisper, as Vader would. Accent on the first syllable, destiny. All right, that's the end of that passage. So Tov didn't end up running for office. Uh, thank God for him. Um, uh, I'm gonna show some slides. Uh, we, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, we have this, um, we have a publishing company called McSweeney's and it uh, publishes a quarterly at about three times a year. And it, and it was started in my kitchen when I lived in Brooklyn. Uh, we were, lived in San Francisco from about ni 1992 for a while. We moved back, moved to New York for a few years. So we started it then. And then we were moving back to San Francisco. And um, I had a lot of friends. My mom was a teacher, my sister was a teacher. I had a lot of friends that were teaching in San Francisco at the time. And uh, what everybody said was that, especially with a lot of the students whose parents uh, had immigrated from other countries and some of the students that were falling behind, what they needed is more of them. All the teachers I knew said, if I could just clone myself, then I could get everybody caught up to grade level. I need more of me in the classroom. We need, need more one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, and uh, we need pe more experts with uh, the written word. And so, meanwhile, uh, we had this publishing company where we would have 10, 15 interns at a time. We had editors, writers, freelancers, graduate students. We knew so many people that had flexible hours on their hands, um, free time to give. Uh, uh, they knew and loved uh, the, the written word, the power and the beauty of the written word, and they were evangelical about it. So we thought, well, if we just combine these two communities, the teaching and uh, community that needs extra help uh, in the public schools, and all of this vast army of sort of untapped people that are willing to help but just need to be giving that, given that conduit, then we, maybe we could do something. So when we moved to uh, San Francisco, we found this building and we thought we would have the publishing company in the back and a tutoring center in the front. And the two staffs would sort of, you know, uh, uh, flip back and forth and, uh, and help whoever dropped in. So we found this place and we said to the landlord, we told the landlord what we wanted to do, and he said, that sounds great. You know, I'm from the Mission uh, District here, and uh, it sounds like a, something that, that, that we could use. And, and uh, he said, the only catch is that you've got to uh, 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 sell something, because this, uh, this is an address zone for retail. The whole street is zoned for retail, so you, you have to be open to the public, and you have to have commerce coming in and out in the front of the building. So. Uh, that was weird uh, because we, uh, we hadn't planned to sell anything. And what, but in Brooklyn, our publishing company was sort of, for a while we had a little store that we, we did sort of as a gag to entertain ourselves um, in the front where we sold uh, uh, two main things, um, uh, uh, amateur taxidermy supplies. So if you, if you were, uh, had found or slayed an animal of some kind and wanted to preserve it and didn't have the license or didn't want to pay for a professional taxidermist, you could come in and get the basic materials and, uh, and, and stuff your own am animal. And, um, and uh, anyway, uh, the, it didn't do very well in, uh, in, uh, in Brooklyn. And so 
So when we, when we moved here and they told us we had to sell something, we knew the wholesalers for all the taxidermy uh, uh, suppliers. So we thought, well, let's just sell taxidermy supplies. And, um, but it turned out that the address that we had chosen for this building is next to the only other place in the San Francisco Bay Area that already sells amateur taxidermy supplies. <laughs> and that's the place there on the right. You can see it. It's called Pax and Gate. So they sell taxidermy animals and the supplies to do it yourself. So that was unfortunate. So we had to think of something else. And uh, <clears throat> uh, when, we, when we gutted the building, it used to be a weight room, and uh, we took up the rubber floors on the, on the, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the floor. What am I thinking? Yeah, of course they're from the floor. We took up the rubber from the floor and, uh, and uh, the acoustic tile from the ceiling, and we found beautiful wood floors beneath and whitewashed beams above, and everything was about 100 years old. And, and it looked like the hull of a ship. So somebody, uh, when we were just uh, uh, fixing the building up, said, why don't you sell uh, pirate supplies? So um, that's what we did. Uh, we became a pirate supply store. And um, so this is what we designed. I uh, designed these uh, sort of weird shelves uh, on a napkin and gave it to a really gifted carpenter. and he. So all these drawers open and have weird stuff in them, and, uh, and we sort of made it up like, up like a place, not just about pirates, but for a working pirate. You know what I mean? So you don't see sort of goofy rubber pirate gear or plastic stuff. It's for the working pirate. And um, so for a while, we insisted on having some kind of pirate license, like a, a union card. Um, but then it was eventually open to the public. Um, so here you have peg legs in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, crutches, of course. Uh, we sell planks by the foot. Uh, eye patches on the upper left-hand corner. You can see the everyday black eye patch and then uh, different pastel colors for weddings, bar mitzvahs, things like that. And then there's, of course, the, the anti-scurvy uh, medicine that we sell. This is uh, one of our products, beard extensions. Captain Blackbeard's beard extensions. These are... Uh, when our, our plank uh, line was very popular, so I, I, I thought we needed other planks. Like, what if your parrot misbehaves? You need a parrot plank, and then a hamster plank, and the monkey plank. And everybody was having a fun time, and these sold very well. And then I did the kitten plank, and then we got a lot of backlash about that for some reason. People didn't really want the kitten plank at all. Uh, but we, we still sell them, too, I think. Uh, we, I, we must have a pretty uh, big... Uh, sadistic pet owner uh, <coughs> customer base. So um, this is like a, a treasure vat. It used to be a bagel vat, uh, bagel uh, boiling vat. But you go in there, the kids can, uh, they come in. If they dig in, it's full of sand. If they find a treasure, if they find something they want to keep, they have to barter for it by telling a story, singing a song, telling a joke, or drawing a picture. So it's full all the time. These are eyeballs, uh, replacement eyeballs, uh, and, uh, and a handbook for caring for your replacement eyeballs. This is from the same supplier we used at the taxidermy supply store, actually. It's a German company. You can buy any kind of eyeball ever. Like, you just call them up and say, I need a raccoon eyeball, and they will know exactly what you mean and give you some choices. Um, so when you walk in, if you stand in the wrong spot, you get mopped, which is a, a secret container above that opens up and drops seven disembodied mop heads on your head which it was just a goal of mine to have something drop on your head when you walk in, and we settled on mops. This is the fish theater. It's three seats. <laughs> so, so this was, uh, you know, uh, and then right behind it, this was the classroom. So uh, we gave the first 400 square feet to the, uh, to the store, and we thought, okay, well, we've satis satisfied the zoning, and then let's get started on the tutoring. And we just set up every day about 10, 15 of us ready and waiting with a sandwich board on the sidewalk that said, free tutoring after school, especially English-related homework, come in and saw any time from uh, 3 to 6, and we'll be there. And, um, and uh, for the first maybe three months, I had recruited maybe you know, 50 volunteers, and we waited and waited and twiddled our thumbs, and uh, some people quit. And uh, there was some grumbling and questioning of whether or not our services were needed in the neighborhood. And it turned out, um, and then somebody said, well, do you think that maybe there's a, a trust gap 
uh, with the neighborhood teachers and parents because you are operating behind a Buccaneer supply store. <laughs> so that's when we, had, we figured we had to do a little bit more outreach. Uh, so we started uh, contacting teachers and meeting with them and we had an we brought on a former teacher, uh, Nineveh Caligari, to take over the, the operation every day. And um, so, so then it filled up very quickly. Um, right now we have 72 kids that come in every day and they get uh, help right after school. They walk from their school here and get their homework done. And then uh, we communicate constantly with their teachers and parents to see where they need extra help. And, uh, and most of it's one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, and, uh, and then they go home finished, ready, prepared, feeling like they're caught up. They can enjoy their families. They can enjoy, uh, you know, uh, being with their uh, moms, dads, siblings, and everything without this constant stress. And I think that, you know, uh, if you can eliminate a little bit of stress from some of these families, then uh, it's a big thing. So these kids, uh, some of them have been with us from the beginning at this point. Um, so we've watched them grow up. But the, uh, so, and then, we grew from about 50 volunteers to about 200 within the first few months. And then uh, where now we have 1,400 volunteers in San Francisco. And we make it very easy. We say any hour that you can give any month is going to mean something. One-on-one -on -one attention to a student's writing, when you can shine a direct spotlight on their work and give them that attention, sometimes huge leaps in learning can happen during that time, especially kids in huge classrooms. Maybe a lot of our friends who teach have 180 to 200 kids. Uh, a day, and they can't always do that, obviously. Uh, they can't always get everybody caught up unless they work 23 hours a day and no one ever slept. So we tried to, uh, to make up some of that difference. So with the volunteers and with the teachers that we work with, everybody you know, said, well, okay, you're doing this. Why don't you do field trips during the day? So we started doing field trips during the day where classrooms would come in and uh, write books and, and tell stories, and we would leave them, they would leave with a published book. And then uh, these are some of the field trip kids. You put a camera in front of a whole class, it's always a chaos. Um, this is one of the books that they came out with. The book that was never checked out. And uh, f for some reason, it's Titanic. I don't know why. But uh, they're all, uh, a storyteller leads the class. A professional illustrator illustrates what they're, what they're doing. And then uh, uh, each story is left with a cliffhanger. And then they uh, get to end it any way they want to. So, that's every day. This is our volunteer crew, some of them in San Francisco. Now, and then a lot of the teachers said, well, what about the kids that aren't going to come to you anyway? What about the, you know, the, the students that uh, maybe their parents aren't going to drag their, their kids over to the center or they're, they're not going to come on their own? Uh, so we started coming to teachers. So at their behest, we would send any number of teachers, uh, tutors in to any school that they wanted. If they needed 10 tutors every Tuesday for a few months, we would send them in there and they would be trained by the teacher uh, and then work on the teacher's lesson plan. Um, so at any given day, we have a few hundred tutors all over, uh, all over the city. Well, not every day, 200. But anyway, uh, they're, they're all over the city. And, and then some of the teachers in school said, well, what if you guys had a permanent place at the school? So now we have two spots in middle schools in the Mission District where uh, They've given us a room. This, is a, this was a room used for storage off the library at uh, Everett Middle School. They gave it to us. We decorated it in the uh, pirate theme. And we staff it all day. So uh, teachers will come in every, every period, split their classes up, get more one-on-one -on -one attention. We'll have tutors there the whole time. And uh, we can ease the, uh, the, uh, uh, the burden of the teachers and give, more, uh, give students more uh, attention to their writing. And out of Everett Middle School, we published this, the Straight Up News, which is the best middle school newspaper in the country, in my opinion. And so then, you know, uh, we thought, well, we've got all these tutors. We're part of a publishing company. Why don't we publish the student work? So um, Isabel Allende um, gave us a grant uh, in our first year to, to, to do a book uh, with students that became Waiting to be Heard. Uh, this is at Thurgood Marshall High School in San Francisco. So they wrote essays, worked on them for months, um, draft after draft after draft. When I was in high school, I never wrote more than one draft of anything, and I never wrote anything before the morning it was due, you know? That was, that was me, but um, if, you can, uh, if you can give the students an opportunity to be published, that they know that Isabel Allende is gonna be on the other end of it, or Amy Tan sponsored this other book is gonna be on the end of it, like Phil Jackson, the, 
the basketball coach has sponsored a book. Um, it creates this very powerful outside audience that uh, motivates them. They have uh, maybe uh, 80 to 150 tutors will work one on one with the students over sometimes up to five months on these books and you find students really realizing how good they can be if they put in the work, if they do more than one draft, if they keep revising, if they dedicate uh, the time. And I think that if they know that this finish line is at the end, that they're going to be published, this book will be available in stores, it'll be available online, like it'll, uh, it's a real thing, it's permanent, uh, it'll be put on a shelf. Um, they'll work mornings, they'll work lunches, they'll work after school, weekends, nights. Um, the, and they'll write better than they ever have in their life, and, and uh, they'll have achieved a new level for their own writing that sort of sets the standard for their own work for life. So this is, well, we, and so we sell the books in the pirate store, and uh, here are a bunch of the books from, uh, from 826. And what happened with the pirate store is that it, it started out as this constraint, and um, that we thought, wow, we have to sacrifice 400 square feet for this goofy zoning law, and, um, and, and, but then it had all these unintended benefits. First of all, it opened us to the public, where a lot of nonprofits are hidden away. A lot of my friends work on like the 23rd floor of some office building downtown, and they don't have day-to-day -day interaction with, with uh, the public. And so this is like on a busy street. Everybody walks in. They say, what the hell is this? And then they learn about this. They learn about what's going on right beyond. Um, they, uh, they might be more inclined to buy a, uh, a hook or a hook protector for nighttime um, if they know that all the money is going to the center right, beyond, right behind. And so we've gotten a huge percentage of our volunteers, teachers, donors, uh, students, everything from being open to the public and having this sort of goofy uh, entryway. So, um, so the store model, I had a bunch of friends still living in Brooklyn, the guy that was running the taxidermy supply uh, store with me, uh, said, well, let's open a center like that in New York. Uh, we could use one in Brooklyn. And um, so he didn't have necessarily the same zoning constraints, but he chose to do the same. Uh, this is the entryway to the, between the store. You can see the ocean maps there on the left and then the, uh, the, uh, the tutoring center. So when he opened in Brooklyn, he said, I'm going to have that retail model too. And, um, but he didn't want to sell pirate supplies. He didn't think it would work in Brooklyn. And, uh, but, uh, so he said, well, let's, uh, let's sell crime fighting supplies. So it became the Brooklyn Superhero Supply Company. Um, and with every service that's ever been offered, uh, it, we, the intent was to make it look like one of these locksmith shops where it's like, we're a notary public and we sell, uh, shoelaces and we want, uh, we can do insurance claims for you, whatever it is. So it takes about 15 minutes to read everything here and you have to stand in the middle of the road so it's not advised but so it's the same thing this is for the working superhero it looks like a Costco for superheroes gears and manuals this is the villain containment unit where kids come in and they put their parents in there and then they can shop this is the office to you can see a vault there at the at the bottom if you want to buy something you have to put your purchase in the vault that goes up a lift an electric lift to the, uh, the guy in charge of the store who's about maybe eight feet off the ground and he insists that you uh, recite the vow of heroism. Um, you can't buy anything unless you recite the vow, um, which I think really cuts back on some of their sales, but <laughs> they do it and then they, they recite the vow and then they make the purchase. This is some of their products, mussels and heavy syrup. And this is a uh, these are all handmade, by the way. We, it's all designers and volunteers that make the products. This is uh, if you want a secret identity kit. Um, it can tell you everything you need to know. It's a full dossier on somebody like Sharon Boone, a marketing executive from Hoboken, New Jersey. So you open the box and you find out everything you need to become Sharon. This is the capery, which is very popular. Kid will come in, he'll need a new cape needs to decide whether it's a winter or summer superhero costume he needs, whether it should breathe, um, cotton, wool, nylon, and then once he's uh, set, he steps up those two steel graded steps and we turn on the fans. <laughs> it's uh, hydraulic fans from above and below and uh, uh, you can um, 
see how it works in action because it's very embarrassing if you get out there and your cape is bunching up or something like that. So you need to know how it's going to flow. So there, you, uh, this wall moves. It's a secret door that's full of products and it opens up and that's the back, um, which is the tutoring center here. And uh, you can see on the back uh, the uh, time in all five boroughs of New York. <clears throat> Keep track. So, and this is, uh, you know, this is it every day. I was there a few days ago. Um, it's packed. The same things happen. One-on-one -on -one tutoring. Kids come every day. It's, uh, and what's, what's great about these places is that, is that there's no stigma. You go through the superhero supply company, it's not like I'm going to the place because I'm behind or I'm going to this place that my parents have to drag me to. They, it makes it something fun to go to. It's another place. It's a third place. It's not like staying after school, which is fine, but sometimes the kids, you know, it's time to, to find this other place. And, and at the same time, we have workshops every night, too, for kids that want to, you know, do anything from digital filmmaking to, uh, to uh, poetry to uh, um, uh, playwriting. And um, so that's why we call it a writing and publishing center for, for everybody. So a kid that might be working on a novel and he's gifted kid might be working side by side with, with somebody who's a grade level behind trying to catch up. So we sort of try to emphasize that and try to make it playful enough and, uh, so that there isn't that stigma and uh, in a warm enough environment that it's, like, that it's a safe haven. And um, so this is one of our students um, who has been with us for a while in Brooklyn. The other thing is like even if the help is available at home, uh, home isn't always the easiest place to do homework. There's distractions, there's TV, there's all of these other things. Can you guys read this over there? No? Yes? One person saying no. Um, well, this is Khaled who's talking about, you know, how at home there's just all these distractions, TV, video games, everything else. And uh, so he goes in, he gets the extra help, he knows he's done at 5, 5.30, and then if he's finished with his homework early, it's been checked, um, he feels satisfied with that, then he can do projects on his own and, do, and write books on his own, and then they get published in these anthologies. We put out like about a dozen a year. So they've been published many times. He got to, to speak at uh, the Brooklyn Academy of Music with a bunch of professional authors and, uh, and musicians, which we do all the time. Students who make films have a red carpet opening at, the, at BAM and uh, with uh, you know, fake paparazzi and all that stuff. So then I had some friends that were uh, wor working in education in Seattle, and they said, well, we need a place here. So then they formed this, the Greenwood Space Travel Supply Company, with, uh, they got some help from some actual NASA scientists and Boeing exec uh, scientists to put this place together. This is one of their products, the Near Death Ray, and the slogan is, why kill when you can be stunning? <laughs> and so to get from the store to the back, this is like an old uh, dark room door that sort of turns around. It's very low tech, but it's kind of fun in a way. So to get back there, you spin it around and then you get to the uh, tutoring center behind. And this is like an exceptionally homey one, homey 826, and uh, so you can see it in action. Uh, I'll skip this. So um, I got a Marty Lay. So this in Chicago, where I'm from, uh, I had some friends that were there, and a friend of mine was teaching fifth grade on the west side, and, and she said, well, she could have a big impact if she switched, if she ran one of these centers and worked with all the teachers that she knew. And um, so, but it was, uh, I, I spoiled the surprise, but it was, uh, they wanted to have, sell spy supplies, you know, for the working uh, uh, spy. And, um, but if you're a spy, you can't be seen walking into the spy supply store. That doesn't fly. So it had to be some kind of place that sort of told you to move along. Nothing interesting here. Uh, so uh, we called it the boring store. And uh, everything about it, this is uh, by the designer Chris Ware, a uh, cartoonist. And um, so there's about 1,500 words about how there's nothing. This is the most boring place in the world. So, and there's never anything interesting in the windows or anything either. It's like always like masking tape. You know, and a big display of masking tape. And when you walk in, there's uh, about 50 cameras. And this is their store. You know, and the weird thing is, is that the storefronts, again, it, it, turned, it, it turned into this thing that attracted a certain type of uh, volunteer. Um, 
and it, it attracted a type of volunteer that, 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 that they think a little differently, we think. And, and, uh, and, we, and they attracted volunteers with some education background, would-be educators, people that are dipping their toes into education, um, <clears throat> uh, and also just uh, people that are from a million different fields, from technical writing to advertising writing to, uh, to I don't know, anything, lawyers, uh, uh, um, nuns, um, you know, everybody, uh, and retirees. Uh, we just, it, it attracts, but everybody, when they walk through this sort of bizarre storefront, the brain switches a little bit, and it says, okay, well, I'm not going to learn in some, it, it, all these, there's going to be more options open to me. I'm not going to be judged for n learning in a non-traditional way. I'm not going to, the tutors here are going to be able to sort of work with me in different ways. And the beauty of one-on-one -on -one tutoring is I didn't learn in a traditional way. And I always, I always had to have things explained to me in like not the first or four, third or fourth way, but like the fifth way. Then I would get it. And um, that's the beauty of one-on-one -on -one tutoring. You can try it like one way, another way, another way. And somehow, because of these bizarre storefronts and the sort of uh, the spirit of the place, we attract, I think, tutors that think a little bit differently or they're they're, they're get into a mindset to think differently, and that's what you need to do to somehow some, to, to really uh, to, uh, to uh, make these breakthroughs with with students. And once you make the breakthrough, then they feel confident going in the next day. So that's that's Chicago. This is a great story. Raina um, came in one day to uh, the uh, the Chicago Center. She was told to come there from her by her teacher. She had a report due, and. And the teacher said, well, go to this place. They'll give you help on your report. Um, and so she had her dad drive her by, and she planned to basically just come in, and she thought that she could get, like, a piece of paper that proved that she had been there, you know, and then she could walk out. And um, But she went in, and they sort of attacked her, like, what do you need? And, you know, and sort of sat her down, and she sat down next to a guy that, like, his dissertation was on the subject, subject that she had to write about, you know? So... <laughs> She, uh, she got, you know, she got uh, sucked in, and, um, and her dad was still double parked outside uh, two hours later, and, um, but uh, she stayed, she finished her work, she did really well. Her grades went up from, you know, C's uh, to straight A's, and she's been with us, got three years now, I think, and she's sort of a spokesperson for the program there, but. Um, so in L.A., uh, they wanted to do something. This uh, center opened on the east side in Echo Park in L.A. And uh, so they thought of uh, a 7-Eleven for time travelers. So this is the Echo Park Time Travel Mart with the slogan, Whenever you are, we're already then. <laughs> and they sell mammoth chunks and uh, leeches. This is uh, shade. So you just, it takes a little bit of time, but you buy the... This is just seeds for oak trees. You can go back in time, plant the seed, and then come back, and then you're set. So this is Viking odorant. This is the most popular product there, actually. This is the uh, Time Freezy Super Slush, Hyper Slush, and it says, out of order, to come back yesterday. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, uh, that the centers can do is uh, we work directly with teachers. We rarely sort of go from the district down, but it's usually from the teachers up. And Jane Patterson has been with us for a while in L.A. And, um, you know, what she's saying here that, you know, it had, this, was, uh, this quote was from 2008, and it had been about seven years that she'd been teaching in the L.A. Uh, Unified School District and had never been given the chance because of the constraints of No Child Left Behind um, to... Uh, to even let the students write about their own lives. And in my experience, that's like the first thing you write about. Like, who, that's the main thing that kids want to get off their chest. Like, talk about their lives, and that's the way that you can sort of get them interested in writing in general and passionate about it. But all of these, uh, they're, 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 they're squeezing the creativity out of teaching. They're squeezing it out of these, uh, out of classrooms. And, uh, you know, just now, I think we're all sort of, uh, the, the schools and teachers are fighting back and trying to give more time. But... Sometimes these outside uh, agencies like ours can sort of give them the opportunity to, to write about themselves, write about their lives, and, and, uh, and, uh, and have these uh, work published. And so these are the last two. This is uh, in Ann Arbor, a group formed and uh, applied for a membership, and they opened the Robot Supply and Repair uh, <clears throat> Center, where, uh, you know, it's actual robot supplies. And uh, 
they didn't have any real robot repair supplies for the first year, and like scientists from Ann Arbor uh, would come in looking for some, like, do you have a uh, geometricon or whatever it is? And then when they didn't, they were really miffed. And so we made them set up a corner where it's real supplies, like real, I don't know any of this stuff. But anyway, there's a place where you find these parts and they're really expensive actually, but um, it's legitimate now. And then this is the most recent one. I was here last night. Um, this is in, uh, I'm, my family's from Boston and uh, in Roxbury, uh, they, they, uh, this is a new building that's uh, affordable housing above and they gave us the basement, or not the basement, the first floor. The uh, Domino's really wanted this spot. And, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a neighborhood that needs sort of fewer Domino's and chain stores and more sort of uh, people that they know are gonna s stick around a while and, and contribute, I think. And um, so they gave us this for cheaper rent than Domino's was willing to pay. And the group in Boston decided to, to open the Greater Boston Bigfoot Research Institute, which um, if, if, it's a very incongruous place for the Greater for a Sasquatch uh, Center. But, um, and, that, and so this is, a, and, but, but our network is uh, 10 centers in seven cities. And, um, but there's a lot of other places, people keep, you know, people will say, well, we need something like that in our city and we can't, we're not, we're not big enough. Ryan's is part of our national office and there's only three people in the national office. So we can't, and we have no money to start new centers. And so uh, we always encourage people to do so on their own terms and sort of if they want to borrow ideas, they can. This is a satellite space we have in Williamsburg, New York. This is Word Street in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. These are all centers that are sort of based on our idea or affiliated in some way, but not directly part of our center. That's Word Street in the basement. This is free rent that somebody gave them in the basement. This is Ink Spot in Cincinnati. You Speaks in San Francisco. They precluded us, I mean, preceded us. Studio St. Louis in St. Louis. Austin Bat Cave in Austin. This is uh, the newest one, Fighting Words in Dublin, Ireland. This was started by Roddy Doyle, who wrote The Commitments and uh, a million other books. This is a really fancy place, actually. They have real money, um, you know. <laughs> leave it to the, Europe, you know, like they actually fund things uh, there. So they had rent and, and money and everything. And, uh, oh, I'll show these in a second. Oh, sorry. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, I, um, I, uh, I don't know uh, what, what, what programs like that, uh, like this, there are in Little Rock. But um, if anybody ever wants to talk about sort of something like that or partnering in, in some way, we're, we're definitely open to it. Uh, we're sort of, uh, there's a few, we'll have a few new cities in the next couple of years. Um, and right now it, all, it always starts with a, a local group that sort of comes up with an idea and raises some money and sort of finds a location and partnerships with schools. and. And then uh, we'll sort of help them however we can, either to be part of us or, or just uh, 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 a, uh, you know, semi-affiliated center. But um, um, I think it, it's a really interesting time um, because uh, we have a, a first family in office that uh, Clinton was, I think, uh, the first real writer in a while. Kennedy was a great writer, and actually Carter was a really good writer. Um, and here we have Obama, who's written um, beautifully a couple books uh, before office, and, and Michelle Obama is a big supporter of the arts and did so publicly the other day at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, she said, "The arts aren't just a nice thing to have, but uh, they uh, <clears throat> tell us who we are as a people." And um, and I think that you know we're we're still at a tough point. We're at a period of uh, at the same time. Everybody sort of, I think, believes in arts education and believes in the need to be able to express oneself effectively and how the fundamental that is. But at the same time, schools are getting squeezed more than ever. Half the teacher that we, teachers that we know in California have been given pink slips this month, meaning they don't even know if they're coming back or not in August. Schools are getting consolidated to save money. They're moving students around left and right. And um, all the, the delicate ecology of all of these schools is being thrown off. And I don't know the state of things here in Arkansas, but I think that just as a country, we fundamentally still haven't made the sea change commitment and realignment of our thinking that is absolutely necessary. I just don't think that education should be first or in the first hundred things on any budget chopping block because 
the effect that it has on our students when we see them nine, ten years old and they know that their school's closing the next year or their teachers can no longer afford to teach uh, or don't even know if they're coming back the next year. It's absolutely devastating. And um, every one of these years, every one of these little shifts um, is, uh, is life-changing when you're eight and nine years old. So I don't know. I think that it's an exciting time in a way, but um, 2009 has been hard for the schools that we know, and 2010, I think, is going to be even harder. So it's uh, more than ever, I think, that we as a public have to sort of step into that breach a little bit and help wherever we can. And we're trying to raise some money and expand a little bit this next year to sort of uh, fill uh, what we expect to be sort of a doubling of the need. And um, I don't know. So I don't have any sort of, uh, I, I try to be uh, optimistic about everything. And I think that, you know, Obama modeling behavior like he does, being, being a guy that really talks about books and writes books and reads books and everything is powerful to our students. And, uh, but uh, I really, I think that uh, I want to see more of that stimulus money coming our way. Uh, <clears throat> coming everyone's way and uh, and just sort of uh, I think a, a new commitment to sort of uh, saving and preserving the sanctity of, of schools as they are and building them up as much as possible as sort of like the number one priority but um, so any questions I, I uh, yeah, just noticed that it's already seven or six what time is it what time zone are we on seven, seven. All right. All right. Questions? And uh, can you wait till we get the microphone to you so we can? Right, we have a question. I think Annie has a question right here, Bob. It's it's warm in here, right? Yeah. And I'm wearing wool. All right. You're and in the south, Dave. Yeah, I know. I got to get a new coat. You are so creative in even how you report to us what the possibilities are for the future. My question is that all of the cities that you identified, I know the urban environment as it relates to achievement of students in the urban centers. Because Arkansas is a rural state, and because of the achievement of testing in our state, how do you see this particular creative model could work in rural states? Um, you know, I think it has the same, we have a, some of our former tutors and friends who teach uh, in a lot of rural schools now through uh, different programs, some through Teach for America. I have a friend, friends teaching in like Clinton, Louisiana, for example. Clinton, there we go again. Um, and they're trying to use some of these uh, 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 ideas. And some of the best teachers I've seen are ones that really sort of think differently in general. Because again, I didn't go to school every day when I was a kid to, to do the tests and to fill out Scantron forms. I was interested in the arts. and I was in the you know, art room all the time, and that was my sort of sanctuary. So we have to give the students more than one reason to go to school. They're not just machines that are built to be tested twice a year and to sort of satisfy some need that we have to sort of judge them against kids in Singapore or whatever else. I think that you've got to give them um, uh, inspiration. You have to uh, uh, give them a reason to, uh, I think that, you know, uh, if you give them the tools of self-expression and you also validate that, whether it's through publishing or outside audiences or readings or just like more people from the community sort of looking at their work and validating it and saying, I hear you. Um, and it gets hard when that's one of the first things that are cut. You know, when, when budgets get cut and, uh, and teachers don't have... Yeah, the supplies that they need and the salaries get cut and the, some of the better teachers leave and everything, it all gets squeezed. So, I don't know, um, until we have sort of a whole, um, uh, you know, change fundamentally as a country, I think uh, it's going to be up to uh, private uh, uh, members of the community and wherever it is, cities or rural areas, to sort of step in, and uh, especially colleges, too. And some of these rural areas are never that far from a state school. I went to school in East Central Illinois, and we had no involvement, really, with the local community or the schools there. But think about that. Tens of thousands of potential tutors and people that should be going in and, in and out of the school. There should be a, a, a ten-lane highway between the local schools and the college, you know? So I don't know. It's as good of an answer as I have. But I agree. It's... That's our next thing. If we could really, if somebody gave us a hundred million dollars or something, uh, and we're lucky to get thousand dollar grants, like uh, uh, we would be, we would branch out into these rural areas too if we could. 
Questions? Anybody got any other questions? Yep. There's one right over here. I was just curious, you all focus on the children. How do you get the parents on board and do you interact with them? Are they part of the community as well? Um, every city has a parents board uh, that sort of helps guide the programs that we run and what's needed and that we meet with them uh, all the time. Um, they also cook for us uh, when we have events, so they're there all the time. Uh, especially in San Francisco, we have a, uh, I bought an old church pew um, at a flea market in, in, in Berkeley, and, uh, and I set it up so the, kid, the parents could watch their kids get tutored if they wanted. And there's a bunch of moms that come every day and sit and, uh, and watch. I wanted it to feel safe that way, like if they want to watch, they can. And uh, So all of the centers have a place for parents if they want to be there. Um, they're deeply involved um, everywhere and always asking how they can do more because I think uh, so many of our families are immigrants and they just feel, I think, you know, so many families sacrifice so much to come here. And, uh, and then they're sending their kids to the public schools that they're assuming, you know, will give them an opportunity they didn't have. And then if they fall behind, the stress on a family is just absolutely insane. And, and uh, so if you can sort of ease that a little bit, they get, they're very grateful. So we end up get, be getting very close to these families. And they have input left and right, I mean, whatever they need. We're, you know, the, the, cra the thing is, is that, and especially you Clinton School people that might go into nonprofit work, the thing that, the one thing that we did, uh, we made a lot of mistakes, but one thing that we did right at the beginning is we said, we know a certain amount what we want to do, but we're going to, we're completely pliable to the needs of this neighborhood. So you teachers are going to tell us what we need, and you parents are going to tell us what you need, and we are going to be elastic. And we're going to sort of send our army wherever you want it to go and, and gear it to whatever, whatever you need. And um, that really helped from the beginning. And every 826 serves a different community. So, uh, you know, uh, most of our families are Spanish-speaking at home, and in some cities it's not the same way. You know, in Boston, actually, there's a, a, about half the daily students are Somali. So um, that comes with other needs. So, got a question back here. Yes, we got two back there. Um, you've kind of helped, uh, I think, resurrect um, short stories and essays um, over the past few years. Do you feel like that art form, uh, there's a need for it more in kind of current times than there was in previous years? Um, well, I'll say first that like, there's a, I could name a hundred far better short story writers than me. It's a form that I need to work on a lot. Um, but I think that, you know, this country is the premier short story producing nation in the world, uh, for whatever that's worth, you know. Um, we have at least 200 incredibly good literary journals that publish mostly the short story, and elsewhere in the world there's maybe one in Spain, one and two in England. I mean, it's, it's really an American form, and I think that we, it has a really robust following, even though some of these journals are read primarily by other writers, but it's still... I think a good thing. So I don't have any fear for that, especially since there's so many writing programs now, and that's primarily what they teach is the short stories. So um, that's something that doesn't need much help, uh, at least for now. Um, wish more people would buy these collections, you know, by short story writers, because they're phenomenal. But, but uh, yeah, I don't know if that helps. Bob, the gentleman yeah. right behind you. Yes, Dave. Hi. Since you how are you doing? Um, since you guys have been working in all the m major urban uh, cities uh, throughout the nation, have you guys developed a tracking for uh, the middle school children who go on to college? Yeah, that's okay. such a good question. And every foundation wants to know that, you know? Because we started out sort of with my model. It's just like anybody can come in any day. And if you need help, we might see you once a year. And you come in, with, especially like kids will come in with their college essays, especially in the, in the fall, we don't see them again because they leave. And, uh, and um, it's harder to raise money that way with the big foundations. They want you tracking. And so that's why in San Francisco, we have a program, the 72 kids that come in every day, come in every day. And we track them every week with their teachers and parents, and we track them at the end of the year, and we're going to stay with them ideally you know, all the way through, and um, as much as we can. 
to sort of prove. Here's where they were, here's where they might have been, and here's where they're going. Um, but at the same time, I really, I like to have it loose enough so that it's not some, you know, railroad that can't get off. It's sort of like, you know, I still want to be able to, because we, some of the most powerful stories are like Reina Delgado here, who just came in one day. She got the help she needed, it was transformative, and, and, and everything's turned around. So, um, but we do do it. And um, even though our middle schoolers, we don't, they don't come in every day during high school as much. Um, Drop-in is primarily middle school, and we lose some of them during high school where they, they go off to other programs and stuff. But, but it's the big question, is the tracking. You have a copy of What is the What there. Can I just show you? So Valentino, I wrote this book about Valentino Rashak Deng. He was a Sudanese, uh, uh, one of the so-called lost boys of Sudan. Uh, spent 13 years in refugee camps after fleeing the war in, in the civil war in Sudan. Um, we worked on this book for four years. Uh, we always, always had in mind that the book would, you know, ideally, uh, the, the money would be his. He'd control it however he wanted to. And uh, he wanted to start a middle school, uh, not a middle school, primary school in his hometown. But when he went back to Sudan, we went back in 2003 and then again in 2006, 7, 8. And all the, uh, the, the, the elders and, uh, and uh, the parents and the kids and the, and the t teachers in the town said, well, we don't need another primary school. We need a secondary school. So again, he was elastic. He developed a different idea. And um, Valentino, for those of you, do you guys know, anybody know Valentino in this book? Um, he just opened his secondary school. He, uh, in less than a year, he built a 14-building secondary school complex in uh, rural Sudan where there's no roads where he is, uh, or there's only roads partially, dirt roads, part of the year. And he built it for a budget in an area that uh, a lot of NGOs haven't had a whole lot of success. And this was uh, a few weeks ago. Um, looks like Stanford, doesn't it? With the arches. Valentino and I had visited Stanford once, and then he went back there and sort of had this idea of the arches and gave it to a local builder. And, so this is an incredible thing. It opened about 10 days ago, and it'll, uh, by the end of the summer, it'll have 400 students, uh, half boys, half girls, um, going to secondary school and, and boarding there, too. So they'll be coming from all over southern Sudan to go to this school, and uh, it'll be uh, uh, sort of a, a model for the region, ideally. And, and Valentino didn't have experience running or building a school or anything, but he became this incredible builder, contractor, administrator, teacher, transportation expert, driver of an 18-wheel truck. I mean, everything, negotiator for bricks. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, so, anyway, so that, if anybody's interested in Valentino, go, go, uh, go to his website. Um, these are the first two students who got registered a few weeks ago. Um, but we could go on and on about education in rural southern Sudan, too. Um, any other We got one more question. Thoughts? Nancy. Relationship questions. Right here. Anything wait, about... Wait, wait, wait for the microphone, Nancy. Boyfriend, girlfriend. <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned the $100 million figure, and what yeah. we were wondering... You have $100 million well, well, in your pocket, maybe, it just so yeah. happens. But if in this room there, was a, there were a group of people or an individual who were so inspired by your stories and by the successes that they would have an interest in you know, launching an initiative like this, what, what, what kind of startup do you suggest? Or what, if you did like a five-year plan, what are we talking about? Well, we have like applications from about 10 cities right now that say, here's our board, here's our, where we want to be, here's what we want to do, and here's who it'll serve. So these thick applications, and it's really just a matter of fundraising for most of them. We want them to be viable, so you have to raise a certain amount of money before we can say yes. And, uh, and that's, where, that's where the problem is, is that there are a bunch of like great, inc incredibly enthusiastic people, but they don't have the ties to the, the money. And... Um, we want them to have, you know, a year, year and a half at least of money in the bank before they start up. And, but LA started with $11,000. Michigan started with, uh, well, they, they had a donor. They had one angel donor that had guaranteed a certain amount of money a year. But some of these start with budgets of about 150000 a year, just salaries. And every, it's usually one, two salaries and the rest are volunteers. And you've got to pay rent on the building. So it's really lean. You know, even in San Francisco, we have 1,400 volunteers and only seven full-time staff. So some of the spot spaces who have been around for four or five years still only have three or four staff members. We tend to add one a year. So it's the leanest, cheapest organization ever known to man, or I claim it is. Um, 
So it doesn't take much, but we need that startup money for each one. If we could say yes, you know, to uh, some of these cities um, to, you know, expand a little bit, rent a space, and really open, then the rest of it just flies. I mean, once they're open, the fundraising is not as hard, but it's that usual, that first startup money. So you and I will talk. You have uh, somebody in this room that you know of with $100 million burning a hole in their pocket. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody.